Well, I'm going to read to you from Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9 to 12, message version of this insight the wisest man who ever lived had um, about life and about relationships and about success in life. And he said, it's better to have a partner than go it alone. Share the work, share the wealth. If one falls down, the other helps. But if there's no one to help, tough. Two in a bed can warm each other. Alone, you shiver all night. Be, by yourself, you're unprotected. With a friend, you can face the worst. Can you round up a third? A three-stranded rope is not easily snapped. The title of this message tonight is Finding Your Peloton. Finding Your Peloton. Everybody say Peloton. Peloton. Say it again. Peloton. One more time. Peloton. Okay, I'm making you say it a few times because it is not a word you've recently used. So you need to hear yourself saying it so that you're on the same page with me. I've been using this word quite a bit. Well, actually, this is quite a new message. I still don't know if it's a Ford or a Ferrari. We shall see. <laughs> I'm still early driving it, so we'll see. Um, but I'm making you say it three times, especially again so that, I don't know, maybe tomorrow, Wednesday, when someone says, what did that guy speak about on, on Sunday night? You don't say uh, something about uh, finding your pelican. <laughs> okay? Though I believe God has a pelican for everyone. I don't know how I know that, but the Lord just revealed it to me right now. Now... Peloton, as you can see with the image up there, is a cycling term. And um, I was watching uh, uh, one of our many European equivalents of Tour de France when I was watching this dynamic take place. And of course, the commentator is always using this word peloton, mentioning the peloton. So I captured it. I took a mental photograph of it. I wrote it down and I looked up the word and I was fascinated by First of all, how strategic and forensically thought through these road races are. And the Tour de France, as you may know, is three weeks uh, long and the most prestigious race of its kind in the world. And the bunched up group of riders in a race and, the, and, and the, the length of the riders can be extended for several miles. But the, there are bunches that you'll see if you watch these road races. That bunched up group of riders is called a peloton. The, the word peloton comes from the French word for platoon. And the idea with the peloton is, the job of the peloton is that in the middle of that bunched up group of riders is a superstar rider called a sprinter. And the job of the peloton is all day, every day, for three weeks in the Tour de France, their job is to surround him to act as a windshield and a weather shield to reduce drag and to reduce energy being spent by him that he needs to save for the final probably 30 seconds of the day. And in the last, that's all it is, the last 30 seconds or so of the day, the, pe the peloton separate and the sprinter bolts for the line. All day he has been conserving energy that he would lose if he was on the outside of the peloton where they've been buffeted by the wind and the rain and having to generate much more energy to stay upright and to keep the pace that what it is. But the guy in the middle is up to 70% less energy he has to expend to ride all day when he's surrounded by this human shield of bodies protecting him from the elements. So the peloton's job is literally to protect him to escort him, to chaperone him, to guide him to the sprint moment at the end of the day. And if they've done their job well, by the time he has to break for the line, he has enough in the bank, he has enough juice left in the bank to make sure he's the one that beats the other, the other team that are doing the same thing. There are multiple pelotons, all protecting their sprint rider, and the ones that do their job best and give most energy back to the sprinter He's going to be the one that has most chance of being the first over the line at the end of each day. And then the scores are accumulative over three weeks. And the teams that had the most wins are the ones that finish up winning the Tour de France. And the sprint rider that had the most wins is the one that gets the medal. But of course, he's the sprinter. 
And he couldn't do what he did without the peloton and the team around him day in, day out that helped him to win every single day. And I want to ask you tonight to think about, do you have the peloton factor in your life? Who are you doing life with? Who is doing life with you who feel that their role towards you and whose peloton are you part of? Because I think we should be both in a peloton that serves us that way and I think we should be part of serving someone else's peloton. I think it's both. But I want to ask you, now I've used this metaphor and explained what it is, who does this make you think of? Does anyone come to mind that you feel sees their role in life is to guide you, assist you, serve you, coach you, encourage you towards a winning life? Who does that for you? Because I think every human was designed to be part of a peloton. Jesus had his peloton. He had these 12 guys that took the heat for him. Uh, they also created quite a lot of heat for him. <laughs> Let's just get that clear. Um, I think he had more drama with them than he did with the crowds oftentimes. But that's part of what's involved in building a team. But they saw their role as serving him, looking after him, making sure that they were the advanced troop to prepare the way for him to get rooms ready and crowds ready. And they went ahead of him into towns and villages to prepare his visit. And so all of it was very thought through. And they were his team he did life with. And within that peloton, he had three. And also within these pelotons you'll see on screen are a smaller core. Even within that peloton core, the, 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 the peloton can be 20 or 30 riders. But inside that peloton, there's another inner circle of three or four riders whose job it is exclusively to stay stuck like glue to that sprint rider. So there's an outer wall of buffering and protection, and then there's an inner core of two or three. Now, these two or three um, internal riders that are close to him um, are literally called servants. Their role is described by the French word for servants, which is domestiques. They are called domestiques. Their role is to be domestiques, to be servants, to be house servants, to be servants like in Downton Abbey. <laughs> Their role is to, is to be domestiquing, to be serving the sprint rider, this small court. And Jesus had these three domestiques, these three close people that saw versions of him the others didn't, that were in intimate Q&A with him, that he took with him away from the broader peloton into other expressions that they didn't see because he knew that these three had a destiny that the other nine did not. And by the way, I never see anywhere in Scripture him explaining himself to the other nine that didn't get included. Um, because Jesus understood, and I think he taught them to understand, that, that team building is not a game of chess, it's a, game of, it's a game of chess, not checkers, that everybody in the team doesn't have the same value and all move the same way. That's what we think team is, especially in the church. But team is more a game of chess when all the pieces that have different value move multiple directions, including backwards. Um, if backwards is your sweet spot, if that's where you should be moved back to, to function well, then that is a bonus because you will be happier to be taking a seat that's a little bit further back in your mind in the pecking order. And if you have a problem with that, it's called ego. Um, but the placement of people in the right seat to get the best out of them is an art. And Jesus placed these three guys around him and the domestiques in the peloton are chosen especially for their stamina to stay with him all day and ride close without colliding. It is a, there's a lot of skill more than I realized in cycling when I've talked to professional competitive cyclers and studied this stuff online. And I want you to think who are these people in your life? The Apostle Paul had his peloton. We know he had Silas and we know he had Timothy and we know he had people that traveled with him extensively. But if you read Romans 16, which is just a long list of names that you're tempted to skip, read it sometime this week. It is a list of about 30 people, all of whom were part of Paul's peloton. They're only named once. So you don't know that they were in his life, but they were in his life enough for him to feel he had to mention and respect and honor them. Some of them he just said, he mentions a person's name and said, she was like a mother to me. That's all. Then he moves on. But that's a big thing to say about somebody in your life. 
So though she only gets one line, this lady, whoever she was, was hospitable and kind and loving and nurturing to him when he probably didn't have a mother. So he mentions the gift of these people. So Paul had his equivalent of the Peloton that were helping him achieve what was in his heart to do. David had his mighty men. And before the mighty men, he had Jonathan that was one of his domestics. Jonathan was willing to surrender the throne, though he was the heir to be. Jonathan was willing to step aside and promote David to be king because Jonathan understood it's better to be a good sergeant than a bad general. And Jonathan knew that David would be a better king than he would ever be. So he was very happy to promote David to become king. And then for all kinds of reasons that are complicated, he chose to stay in Saul's peloton and died on a field he shouldn't have done with a sprint rider that he should have left a long time ago. Moses had Aaron, and Moses had Ur, and Moses had uh, his sister, Miriam, and Moses through his life had different individuals. Uh, Caleb, uh, one time his father-in-law came, Jethro, and acted as a temporary uh, peloton, advisor, counselor for a season of his life. Um, Joshua had Caleb, Jonathan had his armor bearer, and so on and so on. So, so it is biblically normal, I think it is humanly normal, that everybody should somewhere find and have not just friendships, not just family, not just blood relatives. Some of your blood relatives are the opposite of a peloton. Some of the people you do life with because you do life with them because they're your family are not serving you at all. They're not helping you win in life at all. That's why I said this morning and say again tonight, the best thing some of you can do this week is to remove yourself from the family and friends WhatsApp channel. Because it's doing your head in. And you're on it because your family, and to remove yourself, you're afraid of what they'll say to you, of who do you think you are. But you know being on there is not good. And you may say, I don't interact, I don't contribute. Yeah, but you're reading the stuff. You're reading the gossip, and you're involved in the drama, and it's often at someone else's expense. And so it's part of realizing that even though you have people around you, are they around you by design or default? Is who you do in life with, is that thought through? Is it intentional? Because the peloton is very carefully chosen. You don't get to be in the peloton if you don't understand your role and you don't understand you're never on camera, your name's never mentioned. These are nameless, faceless people without whom the sprinter couldn't win. But they know that they're there to make him win because if he wins, they all win, is how, they, how they're wired. This team thing, this team win. And I want to say that your peloton... Um, I know I've referred to it and the picture on screen and the characters through scriptural history. I know I've mentioned a physical version of that, but your peloton doesn't have to only be physical. It can be virtual. You can now have an online peloton. You can have voices in your life that are people you'll never meet. You can listen to them in a podcast or a TED talk or a book that you read or some way online you access that information and that wisdom in people's lives you can now have a new young people in here all know your life is an internet life. My generation didn't grow up that way. But you are growing up in an internet world, meaning you have access to, to thousands, millions of voices and millions of ideas and millions of thinkers and thought leaders. In any sphere of life you want to know more about, it's at your fingertips. It is a blessing. It is a great world to be growing up in. It has its downsides, but so did my world too that I grew up in. So you can find an online virtual peloton. You can find voices online, people online who get you more than the people who know you get you. You can find voices online that are able to interpret what's going on inside you more than the people you do life with that know you for years and still don't get you. So don't think your peloton has to be physical. Some of you may be sat here tonight thinking, well, I used to be able to answer that question easier a couple of years ago. But for a couple of years now, I've kind of felt I'm very much on my own. I'm outside the group. I'm not part of the in crowd. But I don't want you to feel that this means you need fixing or something's wrong with you because maybe you're between palatins. Because what no one tells us is that your palatins change throughout your life. Who you do life with needs to change through your life based on what version of you you are at this season of your life. And you are not the same person throughout your life. Neither should you be. Don't let anybody tell you, 
Ah, you know, you've changed so much, but they don't mean it as a compliment. You just change. This church has changed so much. I remember a lady saying to me, our church has changed so much. And she said it in a way that I knew it was a criticism. And I said, what do you mean? Well, it's got so large and so organized and so many crowds. And, and, and this lady had been in the church for 20 years. So when she came into the church, of course, none of that was true. So she's saying it like a complaint. And I said, um, well, are you saying that is not a good thing? She said, ah, it's not the same. I remember when. I said, hang on a minute. Let me get this straight. Are you still coming to this church for the same reasons you joined? 20 years on? You're still coming here because you want to have that kind of um, come by our, know everybody's name, um, sit where I always sit, not deal with strangers and crowds thing. Whatever needs in you brought you here, we're glad that we could meet those needs. But right now, 20 years on, you should be way beyond having, you should now be, a, you should now be part of helping someone else to, well, I didn't make a dent on that lady's mind, I'm sure. But she is not uncommon around the world. In all walks of life, by the way. Not just in church world, but many people get upset when things change, as if change is some kind of bad thing. So, you may be a version of you right now that feels more isolated, or you can't readily bring names to your mind, but can you bring authors of books to your mind? Can you think of someone that you are following online, somebody on social media, and when you read their posts or you listen to their podcast, they are right now a primary voice into your life. Then they are part of your peloton. So I'm not up here wanting you to think that I am with some agenda up here um, of uh, a pastor. And you think I know what's coming. He's going to try and get us into small groups. He's going to try and get us in church more. He's going to say the church is your peloton. Because I want to say this to you. Remember now, okay, I pastored the same church for 32 years. So I got nothing to prove about loving the church. And by the way, I am pastoring a church for 32 years in a country where 98% of the population do not go to church and are anti-church, which is also true of Europe. So I've done my time in the trenches, <laughs> slogging it out with those British heathens. And we built a church of thousands in a country where people do not go to church. And I think I was able to do that because of thinking like this. I didn't have language for it. But because I realized later than I wished I had, I realized that, that the church doesn't have to be and should not be. Neither should we claim it to be your only or main or primary peloton. It is arrogant for pastors to say to churches, this is your peloton. This is the only peloton you need. Planted in the house, you shall flourish. All that stuff we trot out. It is arrogant of any body of people. It is arrogant of any education system. It is arrogant of any people group. It is arrogant of any learning group to claim that we have within us the range, the mental range, that we have the we have the perspective range, that we have the emotional range, that we have the learning range, we have the information, the skill set, that we have enough empathy with all the planet in this room for you never to reach beyond this room to find a peloton voice in your life. It is arrogant of us in the church to claim that. And so I believe that the church should be, we want it to be part of your peloton. But it depends whether we're doing church well enough for you to feel that this is a place where you can entrust yourself to others that want to form part of your peloton and whether you feel you can contribute to being part of someone else's peloton in the life of the church. Because I do not believe, and this has been a problem around the world for many years, and I travel more now than I've ever done in churches around the world, and I think it's still widespread, that I think most pastors think the church is their peloton. That you're helping me win. I'm the sprint rider. The senior leader's the sprint rider. And you're kind of helping us win. And actually, it's the total reverse. That you are not my peloton. I am yours. You are my sprint riders. My job is to serve you to a win in life. Your job is to not help me win. My job is to help you win. My job is to build the kind of culture and the kind of empowerment 
and the kind of belief in you. My job is to build the kind of openness and the kind of love and the kind of grace and kindness and acceptance in our church that you win, that anybody that comes here can win. I just heard of a couple that came for the first time this morning to this church and loved it and are gonna decide to join this church. That's happened three times on this trip since I left and came to New Zealand and here. And I, think, and I, I like that feedback because I think if they came on a Sunday when I was talking, they were surprised to find churches talk about stuff like I talked about in the way I talk about it, like many of you are tonight thinking, is there any Jesus coming up in this message? <laughs> and that's my point. When you think that way, you think there's no value in any voice that doesn't mention Jesus every five minutes. Because we've led you to believe that we are the ones that have the word. We are the ones that God speaks to. And, this is the, and all of the voices in your life must be devalued because this is the word. This is the Word of God. And we use that language. And, and when, when I've listened to a lot of people that have said, you know, come back tonight or I'm doing a series. I've got a word. I've got a word. I've got a word. God gave me a word. And I listened to the word. I got more out of a 20-minute TED Talk. So it feels like it's been over-promised and under-delivered often. But what it does is it builds in us this expectation that this is where the real stuff happens in your week. But some of you are going to go home tonight, go online and watch something, a podcast, listen to something that will set you up for the week more than been in church all day did. So I don't want to assume that this automatically is a highly functioning peloton for all of us. And that's okay. We want it to be. And we want the small group to be the smaller core that you do life with and flourish in that. But I know it doesn't suit everybody. This one size fits all doesn't work for everybody. So we want this to be a place where you win and you flourish. But if this is not that for you right now, we're just happy that you're finding it wherever you're finding it. Never feel bad that you're growing with voices and relationships that are not in your church and not even Christian. Never feel to apologize for that or explain it to anyone. All it matters is that you flourish as a human. As I said this morning, I stopped speaking to Christians years ago. I started speaking to humans. Because what we had in our church is we had good Christians that were bad humans. Because we kept teaching people how to be good in the bubble, but they were not good in life. So they were very friendly and smiley here, but they didn't have a smile for somebody that was serving them a coffee tomorrow morning didn't have a smile for somebody that they walk past every day who is begging for a few coins in a doorway somewhere. No smile for that person. And that person in the doorway may well be Jesus in disguise. But we're spending all that love towards people who are already overloved. Some of us are, need to go on a love diet. Some of us are all loved up. You know, some of us get... 20 texts a week to our phone telling us how loved and how appreciated we are. You don't need about 18 of them. Somebody else does. So we get overfed and overloaded, that live, full, die, empty thing. So this peloton often needs its own mirror pouring up to it to say, hang on a minute, is this a good function in peloton? Are we, are we really functioning in the way that we're helping each other win in life? Or are we creating an environment where we have overfed, under-exercised riders? People enter our lives for different reasons. And this will be true of people entering your life and you entering their life. Multiple reasons, but there are three, I think, that stand out in my life. People enter your life for a season or a reason or a lifetime. People are in your life for one of those three things. And I think we get stuck in life mainly because we lack people that enter our life for a reason. Most of us usually are able to point to people who have been in our life for a prolonged season and are in our life for a lifetime. But often we don't get stuck because of a lack of those people. Because the problem with seasonal and lifetime people is they know you so well that they often can't see um, what you most need to help you win. Like that set thing I said earlier about they park up on an old version of you and don't want you to change. But people that enter your life for a reason. These people in the peloton don't finish the Tour de France and then do life together. They come together for a reason. 
And the reason for the Peloton, they simply exist for three weeks. That's all they do. They train all their lives for three weeks to come and for a reason. The reason is to make sure that their team serves that sprinter to a win so that at the end of the three weeks, Tour de France is three weeks, at the end of that time, their team win. And then they disperse. This, is, this was the gift, I think, of Jethro, who came to Moses. He came for a reason. Didn't come for a season, wasn't there for a lifetime. And he entered, he entered Moses' world when Moses was worn out, suicidal, because he was. He asked God to kill him. He said, Lord, if this is how it's going to be, I'd rather you take me now. He got that depressed in Moses. Talking again about the soul and the human soul and the battle to control that. Moses battled depression all of his life. And got so depressed he wanted to, God to take him. Contemplated suicide perhaps. And Jethro rocks up. Jethro said, well the reason you're stressed and don't sleep and you're on prescription medication yeah. is because you are a one man band. Yeah. And you need, to, you need to delegate responsibility for judging the people and for counseling and for dispensing wisdom. You can't do it all yourself. And so he gave him a new organizational strategy that would give Moses longevity. And then he left. And so he got Moses unstuck. And some, some of you need somebody in your life to come soon. And they're already there. And you are resistant to it because it's not in the form you think it should be. It's not a person you've approved of. Um, it's not a Christian. It's not somebody that has the values you have, perhaps. It's not somebody whose lifestyle you approve of. It takes many forms to the people that come into your life for a reason. If it's virtual... If it's a virtual voice, then you don't have to mess with any of that. You can just virtually reach into it, benefit from it. It doesn't matter that they're not from the same value system as you. But sometimes you need people to come into your life for a reason. And some of you are stuck in your life right now. And I pray that this week that someone will come into your life for the reason. And the reason is they come to help you get unstuck. The gift of their voice and the gift of the way they think, the gift of their perception that you can't see, that ability to see your blind spot that you obviously can't see because you're inside your structural blind spot and can't see, so you keep having collisions. The gift of this person that has an outside perspective will come into your life and will come for a reason. And that's perhaps a part of the peloton dynamic that I think we've underestimated in life and I think we've made it too general. But I think the best pelotons in life I'm observing in all kinds of tribes are pelotons that are coming together for a reason. People that come to help you win specifically, strategically, with a contribution to make that no one else that is in your life for a season or a lifetime is able to make. I want some of you to think about this week, have a radar for who are those voices? Who are those people in my life? The Tour de France is written in three stages. And your life is lived in stages. The Tour de France has an urban stage where they're cycling through cities and towns. It has a rural stage where they're cycling through countryside. And it has a grueling mountain stage where they're literally uphill most of the day. And they ride differently according to the terrain of the stage that they're in. And they are strategically energy conserving and riding strategically according to the style the terrain requires of them. And I want you to understand that your life is lived in stages. And you will ride differently according to the terrain your life is in at this time. You can't live your life exactly the same um, when you married. All of my son-in-laws, and one especially, made the mistake of behaving like he was single long after he was married. <laughs> And, and got kids. And his wife would say to him, you can't go for a run. Hello, we got two kids now. That's what you did when you were single. You got to now figure out a different time to do that. You can't do it like you used to do when you had no one responsible to be responsible for. So you got to now be around here, help me. It's Saturday, it's the weekend. You've been gone all week and it was drama. And I would say, dude, you just need to find another time to do that because she's right. So he's riding urban when they are in mountain. And some of you are struggling in your life because you are just not understanding your terrain's changing. Some of you have changed jobs and you're good at the job, but when you change jobs, it's not just about 
been able to do the job. It's about can you fit culturally? Can you get on with these people? Can you deal with that new regime? Can you relate to that new boss? Can you relate to the new time schedule? Can you relate to the new habits in that new environment? And so some of you are about to quit a job because you don't love the job. Not what you're realizing is you're riding in this new terrain like you did in the last three jobs. Or you divorce Phil and marry Steve and you treat Steve like Phil and ditch Steve as well. Then marry George. And then you divorce George thinking George is the problem because you're relating to each of these people in your life like the first one. Instead of changing, realizing, no, Steve is not Phil. That's why I chose Steve. And all along, Steve and Phil were not the problem. You were the problem. We were the problem because we kept relating to the different people the same way. As I said this morning, like being upgraded to first class with an economy mindset. Nobody in first class needs your spare bread roll. It's the economy people that pass those around. <laughs> Got a bit of cake here, do you want it? There is an abundance of cake in first class. I tell you that because that happened to our family. We got upgraded to first class and my kids are passing out muffins because they didn't want them. I'm thinking, guys, we're in first class. Literally in first class, a lady went into the bathroom and she got air travel sickness. She threw up in the bathroom in first class. They literally washed down the bathroom with champagne. Champagne is a rumor in economy. We hear the champagne at the front. We hear it. We never see it. We never, we never get us a whiff of it, but we hear it's up there. What they don't tell you in economy is they're washing the freaking bathroom with it. That's how much champagne they've got. So I said to my kids, don't be, ha- no, don't, no, 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 no. Don't be handing, no, no, no. Don't be, let's just pretend we're used to this. It's a terrible thing to ask kids to do because kids are terrible at faking it. But some of you are not riding in this stage of your life appropriately. That's all it is. You're where you should be. You're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. You don't need fixing. There's no big problem. You don't need deliverance. You don't need an encounter. You don't need anointing. You don't need to go to a conference. You're okay. Your problem is you're not orienting. You're not adapting. So your life has changed. It's a better situation. It's good. You wanted this. It's a great opportunity. Good. All that's been good. God's been good to you. It's good. It's all good. What's the problem then? Because every day you're saying, I'm not happy. I don't fit. It's not. That's right. That's right. So we've got to realize this. Okay. So this is a different Tour de France season. Okay. I need to ride differently here. I need to learn some new skills, which means you have to let go of your ego. Because you may, have been, you may have been a big fish in the other pond. Now you've upgraded to a bigger organization. And here, you're a little fish. And the bigger fish don't care about your background. Now you've got to realize, I now have to come in here humble. I have to learn. I have to audition. I have to prove myself. And that's a good thing. Because now you're writing differently. Now you're going to think before you speak. Now you're going to be listening to other people's opinion who know more than you and know better than you. It's a great life skill to learn. So you're in this new territory and you're riding different because you are not the same you throughout your life. You all okay? Because there's a new, there's a new peloton for every new you. Every time you change and grow and upgrade, you definitely need somebody else in your life. Or you will default back to the comfort of the old you that you just felt familiar with. Entire organizations do that, including churches. We kind of default back to the safety of what we knew. Because though we know it's not working anymore, and though we know we're stuck, we're kind of afraid of the lack of clarity of the next thing. You know, better. That's why they got stuck in Egypt. Because better the Pharaoh you know than the Moses you don't know. Freedom's complicated. And so that's why God had to do all this drama. God didn't need the drama of 10 plagues. God had to just show up with a calling card and say, I'm back. 
and here's what I'm capable of. You'll be okay. I can deal with Pharaoh, is what that was about. And so they went into the wilderness, remember? But they didn't ride that differently. So they died in freedom. How bizarre is that? And yet I can't judge them. We can't judge them because we've all done the same thing. So that the, they're free, but they have this slave mentality. So that in a new season, get off. That's like uh, in the bar in England when it's last orders. They flash the lights or put the towel over the bar pumps. Last orders, last time to get a drink, last orders. So that's last orders. I've got to finish and say one more thing to you that's going to help some of you this week. Sometimes your peloton is you and God, end of. And if you've never found that out, you need to fast. You don't need people. Sometimes in your life, that's the last thing you need. Some of you got too many people in your life. You have to find out that Jesus by himself is enough. I know we sing it, but you've never been on your own enough to find it out. Adam didn't start with Eve. He started with a peloton of one, him and God. Eve was added. She was supplementary. She wasn't primary to his existence and happiness or that have both arrived at once. And sometimes in life you have to figure out that this is a season and, and I went through this, you know, some years ago when our church was reinvented because half of my peloton left. Half the church left when I started bringing in the poor. And so all these people that pledged undying love to me took off at the first sign of a prostitute or a black person or a homeless person or a homosexual or a transvestite or a criminal or a drug addict because these are the people I'm bussing in. And they took off. So... I realized that sometimes your peloton will leave you like they all left Jesus who died on his own and knew he would. So when Peter said, you can rely on me, I'm your domestic, I'm your peloton for life, I'll never leave you, I'll never desert you. Jesus said, dude, you'll deny me three times before bedtime. And Jesus wasn't being unkind to him. He was simply saying, Peter, you are over-promising what your soul is not yet developed enough to deliver. And we all do that all the time. So Jesus knew, and Paul knew, he would die alone. Paul writes to Timothy and mentions names of people that he's like, he's like even, even they've deserted me. As if he couldn't believe that these long-term connections, associations at the end got intimidated and afraid of Rome where Paul was beheaded probably in his late 60s, early 70s maximum and died alone. But Paul knew and Jesus knew that he would die alone. And you all need to know that sometimes you have to go through a season of life called alone and figure something out about your roots into God instead of your straws into people. Because a straw into a person, a straw into an organization, a straw into the pastor, bleeding them dry, sucking the life out of them can feel like a root it's not a root because when that's removed from you if you then you flounder and struggle and say there's no love in this church it means you never had a root into God for yourself you were borrowing strength from others and there's a time when you need to find this internal peloton me and God is okay and Paul was in prison for years he had no physical peloton and it couldn't go online either and you may have a season in your life that you're in now or that's coming up it's a gift to you find out that Jesus is enough on his own and never ever forget that because people will come and people will go but God will never do either so to not build a life based on your permanent indwelling Holy Spirit who is the best buddy you'll ever have and some of you don't know him because other people have taken his place and when they leave, you behave like God left. And God will never leave you or forsake you. But because you've made people God to you instead of Him be God to you, you get over attached to comings and goings. So to let them all go and discover afresh like I did 20 years ago. Uh, me and Jesus are cool. We're okay. You can all go for me. I don't care. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And I was. 
And it was painful and difficult, but God never, ever budged. Not for a second, not for a minute. I couldn't locate him often. And he was silent when I think he should have been more vocal. But that's because he's teaching you to learn that you've got to just keep following your heart. And don't ask for too many details because God is not big on details, which I think is a weakness in him. <laughs> Let's stand together. Come on, time's gone. Father, thank you again for this beautiful church, these beautiful humans here in this room, stepping into a new week tomorrow. I don't know what's coming up for all of you. Some of you are stepping into a continued nightmare. Some of you are going back tonight to the hospital. Some of you are nursing the ill. Some of you are battling in your own body a complicated long-term illness. Some of you are battling relationships and battling dynamics at work and in your family that are complicated. And I just pray this week that this word Peloton will stay in your mind as a reminder that you always have one between you and God. Always, always. And I pray you discover that afresh this week. And I pray this week that you'll be intentional about finding and identifying who these people are that are helping you live a winning life. And you'll tell them that. Would you send a text before you go to bed tonight and let them know, you're my Peloton. They're going to come back and say, I'm not your Pelican. <laughs> no, they are. So you're going to have to really put it in caps, put Peloton in caps. And they're going to say, what are you talking about? And you can impress them with what you've learned tonight. But thank someone. People don't know that they are that to us and they get tired. Because some people are, are protecting you from things that are absorbing in their own lives. And that's worth a thank you. Some people are fielding pain and suffering and protecting you from the amount that you could be experiencing. And that's worth a thank you. Some people are speaking up for you and protecting you and speaking well of you when others are being negative about you. And that's worth a thank you. These people are your peloton. Who are they? Let them know. Find them if you don't have them. And I pray that this next couple of months before this year's out set you up for a win in your tour to 2019 that's coming up for all of you in Jesus name love you guys tonight thanks for listening and you're welcome all day go strong and and social media who's on social media hands all you young people not putting your hands up because you want to be cool I know you're on social media you're not following me on social media, God told me to tell you, you're probably not going to gonna go to heaven. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry to tell you, but I have to tell you that tonight. That's the word for you all if you wanted one. Let's keep in touch on social media. Love you guys. Go strong, eh? Thank you. <laughs>